Let me just say that it is great to be back worshiping in a church where I know the language. I had a fantastic time in Europe, but I never once attended a service in English. When I first arrived on day one, it was Ash Wednesday, I was in Lisbon, Portugal, and the only word that I knew in Portuguese was malasada. No help whatsoever. <laughs> But I knew that there was going to be an Ash Wednesday service at this great, big, beautiful basilica, about a 15-minute walk from my hotel. So I had taken the red eye, of course, and needed a little bit of sleep. So I slept a good part of the afternoon, and all of a sudden I woke up and I realized it was early evening, and I thought, oh, I hope I didn't miss the Ash Wednesday service. Well, I got there right as it was starting, and I just wanted to say I was blown away. It was absolutely packed. There was not a single place to sit in the church, and there was barely a place for me to stand in the back. There were so many people there to celebrate the beginning of Lent. I was told that in Europe, people don't go to church that much anymore, but I guess the people in Lisbon hadn't heard that yet. I was just speechless as I listened to the incredible music and as I looked at the costumes that people were wearing up front. And it was wonderful to be there, but I really didn't understand anything that was being said in the sermon. And most of the liturgy was just way over my head because I don't know Portuguese. However, Thank God for the alleluias and the amens. There were a few words I understood, kind of sprinkled throughout the service. Well, Easter Sunday, I was with my good friend Andrea. I went to the island of Sardinia to hang out with him and his family for about a week and a half. And I went to Mass at the church where he attends Mass. And um, Italian is pretty much like Spanish, and I took Spanish for seven years, and I'd been to Italy before, and I, I knew the language a little better. It sounded a little more closer to Latin and Greek <laughs> than um, Portuguese because it just, Portuguese, I was just lost the whole time. At least in Italy, I could understand some of the words. And as I read the scripture, it was so easy because I already knew the scripture in English. And as I read through um, the prayers, I knew some of the words and I could kind of put it together. But again, when it came time for the sermon, I was completely lost. And I had to ask my friend Andrea, I said, can you tell me what the sermon was about? And he gave me, you know, some neat little snippets of what he remembered. And I thought, oh, well, good, good. Basically, it's Easter, be happy. And I thought, hmm, I was hoping for a little more depth than that. But anyway, it was a wonderful experience. But again, I didn't understand what was going on. Well, I spent most of the three months in southern France. And I practiced and practiced and practiced my French to very little avail. Um, I could read it, I'll just say, much better than I could hear it. And part of that was because I wasn't practicing speaking with too many people while I was there. So um, I think it was about a week after I was at Mass on Easter Sunday in um, Italy, I was in Geneva, Switzerland, and I got to go to St. Pierre's Cathedral where John Calvin used to be the pastor, the great theologian that helped kick off the Protestant Reformation in that part of England back in the 16th century. And, oh my gosh, I was there on a day where they said our community's gathering for a prayer service. And it was just like a typical Presbyterian worship service. And as they showed me the bulletin, I thought, I'm here for the whole thing. I'm going to stay and I'm going to practice my French for the next half hour before it starts. And I had my little app where I could look up words. And so I, I had the bulletin next to me and I was looking things over. And every time I came up with a word I didn't understand, I'd look on my app and I thought, I'm going to know what's going on finally in the worship service. And that was so much more helpful, except when the sermon came again, there was a few Jesuses and Alleluias and Amens, but for the most part, I was completely lost, and I went to several other worship services. Actually, I was at Notre Dame, Notre Dame Cathedral, about a week before the big fire that they had, and I was so grateful to see it before the fire, but Mass had just begun, 
And unfortunately, there was lots of incense, and I'm allergic to most incense and smoke, so I couldn't stay very long. But I went in, and it was nice to be there. But I realized, after every place I went, that I longed to hear the good things that the priests and the pastors were talking about in a way that I could understand, in a way that I could relate to and feel a part of. And I just realized, after I got home, that didn't happen once for me because I didn't understand the language. And that's what Pentecost is really all about. It doesn't matter what language you speak. There are good things that we in the church say about God and Jesus and life that are for you. And Pentecost is about our effort as the Christian community to share in words that people can understand the good things that Jesus taught both as disciples and complete strangers. The book of Acts was written, most scholars believe, by the same person that wrote the Gospel of Luke, and we typically attribute that to a man named Luke. So Luke is part one of the story, and Acts is part two, the sequel, as I might say. And I always think if you're going to read a sequel, at least know what's in the first part because it helps make sense of the sequel. So in preparation for this morning's message, I went back and read through a good part of the Gospel of Luke, and I think we all know what's in there. Now, I remember when I was in seminary and I was studying all four Gospels, what stood out to me about the Gospel of Luke was its sense of inclusion. And that's not to say that Matthew, Mark, or John aren't inclusive, that Jesus' words are inclusive over and over and over, but Luke, as a gospel writer, goes a little deeper, a little further by saying, come on, women, you're a part of this. He hung out with lepers. He touched lepers. He actually, in the gospel of Luke, hung out with a sinful woman, whatever that means. And then Luke makes it really clear that one of his followers that he spent a lot of time with was Mary Magdalene, and we know know about her is she had seven demons. But if you read the Gospel of Luke, we understand over and over and over again, Jesus reached out to the people on the margins of society, people who weren't welcome in other places of worship or government or other social structures, people who were paralyzed, people who were crippled, people who were blind, children that other people were hushing and telling to get out of the way. Jesus said, let the children come to me. When you read the Gospel of Luke, there is no doubt whatsoever that everybody's included in Jesus' wide circle of embrace. And that's what Jesus kept saying about God. The book of Acts takes that theme beginning with Pentecost and basically says those of us who call ourselves the community of followers of Jesus do the exact same thing. We include everyone. And if there's people that other churches or our government or social structures of our society are leaving out, what we do as followers of of Jesus is we go out and we spend time with those people and say, you know what, there are people in society that others say are wrong people. But because we follow Jesus, we say there are no wrong people. There are only people. There are only children of God, and we are not going to exclude anyone. The book of Acts beginning with Pentecost, tells us that God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes into us and leads us to live that kind of a lifestyle and that sense of welcome. And so when I knew that we were going to become an open and affirming church officially in the United Church of Christ, and that actually happened the day before I left on my sabbatical, I was thrilled when our church decided we're going to celebrate this on Pentecost because 
Isn't that what Pentecost is all about? Every single person in the world should hear the good things that we are saying, the good things that Jesus said, the good things that God constantly tells us, because the Holy Spirit is for all of us. We don't exclude anyone. There are, in our minds, I hope, no wrong people. There are only people, and there are only children of God. Now, one of the reasons I'm thrilled that we have an open and affirming covenant is because words matter. Words are powerful because words lead to actions. And we see it in the Gospel of Luke and Acts over and over and over. People said words that were brand new. Lepers, people with leprosy, are okay. It's okay to spend time with them. Women that other people think, well, you don't count anymore based on your lifestyle. The Christian community said, we are going to accept you. You're okay. The people who were blind, the people who were disfigured, the children, on and on and on. The Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, which many theologians call Luke-Acts, is basically saying the spirit of Pentecost blows as wind, as breath, through all of us to be like that. And because of that, and we say those things, we tend to act more like that. Now, the idea here is that words lead to actions. And I know, got to be honest, that sometimes we are hypocritical, each and every one of us. We say things, and then our actions don't reflect what we say. And it's an insult to call somebody a hypocrite, isn't it? But every single one of us has been a hypocrite in some way in our lives. We've said things, and we haven't fully lived out our things with all of our actions. I want you just to say, that's okay, let it go, because I believe that most of the things we say, we actually do. And knowing this congregation, I know that that's the case. When we say something, we get it done. That's how we act. And it's not that we're perfect. We make mistakes in our lives and as a church. But the idea here is that words matter. Our theology matters. And it's really important for us to say, this is who we are as a people. Everyone's included. Now, some of you have heard the story before about my very good friend when I was in high school that... Um, he tried to kill himself our, our, his senior year. We were the same age, and it was devastating for me. He was one of my very best friends. And w as I later learned, he was gay and was dealing with that while going to a church that didn't say what we say in our open and affirming statement. That church said, if you are gay, you are evil. If you want to be with somebody you love, you disgust God. If you act upon your sexuality, you will go to hell. And here is this friend of mine that is knowing that he's that kind of person and hearing over and over and over by our church, by our pastor, by our youth leaders, that he's disgusting, he's evil, he's a horrible person, and he tried to kill himself. Words lead to actions. Now, when I heard this story, I was so bothered by it, but what really got to me was when he was in the hospital, in the psychiatric ward, and the chaplain invited the pastor from our church to come spend time with him, and that pastor actually said to him, it would be better if you killed yourself than to act on your sexuality, because then there's at least a chance you might go to heaven. And you know... It took him years to get over that, and thank God he's still alive, and he went to a different church, I went to a different church. You know, when I think about how words that are used in churches lead to actions, we have a choice, and we need to ask ourselves what's coming out of our mouths. And I ask you, what's coming out of your mouth? 
are they words of judgment? Are they words of condemnation? Are they words of exclusion? Or in the spirit of Pentecost, are they words of grace? Are they words of welcome? Are they words of God's love? We get to choose which kinds of words come out of our mouths. When I think of what that pastor said to my friend, it really clicked for me. I mean, I hate the fact that he said it, but I was glad it finally clicked. My theology, what I say to my church, makes a difference to all of you, doesn't it? I hope it does. I'm convinced it does. And that's why I am so thrilled that we have decided together as a church to say to people, no matter who they are, you are a beautiful person created in the image of God. You are God's beloved, God's beloved child. We accept you as you are. And if you're going through any struggles in life, guess what? So are we, each and every one of us. And we are in this together. Hallelujah and amen. amen.